My name is Silas, and my friends and colleagues know two very important things about me. I'm a conductor, and I love coffee, especially espresso. No matter where I travel in the world, the first thing I try to do is find the best coffee shop and learn about the local coffee drinking habits. If I can, I try to meet up with old friends or make new ones in a coffee shop, of course, so we can talk about life, art, music, or whatever's on our minds. I found that there's no better way to get to know a conductor a little better than by having coffee with the maestro. Today I'm having coffee with Melise Brunet. Melise is the music director of the Northeastern Pennsylvania Philharmonic, and she's director of orchestral activities at the Hayes School of Music at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. I've never met Melise before, but I know she's from my favorite city in the whole world, Paris. And if she likes coffee and music, then we have plenty of things to talk about. So let me give Melise a call. Bonjour Melise, ça va? <laughs> Bonjour Saïla, ça va bien? Et toi? Ah, ça va, mais thank you so much for being on uh, Coffee with the Maestro. And also we're meeting each other for the first time. So that's exciting. Yeah, and thanks a lot for having me. I'm yeah. really happy to be here and to get to know you better. Well, my uh, my morning beverage of choice is an espresso. Every day, double shot of espresso. What are you having? Um, so I'm kind of jealous, you know, because I love espresso and um, the taste and the smell, you know, in the morning. It's just like, Lord. Unfortunately, I'm kind of very, very active person, very dynamic. Uh -huh. And if you give me coffee, I cannot sleep like for a very long time after <laughs> that. Yeah. So I try to, I'm, I'm doing tea, actually. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with Chinese teas, which is a uh, Gong Fu style. So here is a uh, green tea. Oh, wonderful. Gong Fu style that is brewing right now. And soon I'm going to pour it and, and serve it into my guy one and drink it. Great, 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 great. <laughs> I like tea also, so but I have to start my morning <laughs> with espresso. It's the only way for me. Yeah, I get that. But, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, starting a conducting class with my students at 9 a.m. And I was so happy to see them, um, like kind of every day I'm teaching them. I was like, where well, have you been at 9 a.m., you know? And at one point, the students, they said, Dr. Brunet, how many coffee did you have this morning? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, yeah, it's better I don't drink coffee. <laughs> I see. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, I... I've told the story before on, on this show, but the first time I had espresso in my life was in France. And I know you're French, but it was in Aix-en-Provence. And I was there for a summer workshop. And a friend of mine from uh, Montreal said, hey, let's go get an espresso. I said, oh, I don't drink coffee. <laughs> and I've had, I think, uh, an espresso every day since then. That was 20 years ago. That's amazing. So it was like a sudden sudden addiction somehow you know it's the taste and thing yeah. was just boom that's it. well i i i'm american and so i only ever had american coffee when i was younger and i don't like it it's just not yeah. good and uh yeah. and i never even thought about having a, an espresso or a latte or something like that until somebody took me to a good cafe in aix en provence and i said i had no idea coffee could taste like this and now i'm addicted of course <laughs> yeah you're you're correct the difference between a good espresso and even in italy is even different espresso uh, so. yeah. and between the american coffee is just so huge that difference yeah so i think coffee is a big part of the culture in paris where you're from so when you go home do you do you then drink coffee i drink coffee here and there um i love i love one of the favorite activities of french people and is to go to a coffee cafe to go to a cafe, sit at the terrace, you know, with your friends, yeah. have a cafe, and then look at people walking and talk, you know. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very important part of the culture. Unfortunately, also cigarette is still important in France. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, but, you know, a cafe cigarette uh, is definitely something that's still very important in Paris. Yeah, I don't, I don't really smoke, but um, uh, an espresso Never. and a cigarette is very nice in Paris. <laughs> espresso is fine without cigarettes yes yeah that's true also well so now where in the world are you i am in north carolina in the mountains so i'm in boone north okay. carolina which is the western part i'm five minutes away from tennessee 
uh, and it's in the Appalachian mountain. It's pretty high, it's 3,300 feet high. Oh, so, I didn't know uh, so we high. have had our first uh, snows or first snow already. Oh, wow. I didn't realize, I knew that there were mountains in Western North Carolina. I didn't know they were so, uh, so high. Mm. Yeah. And you've been living there for a while now, I think. It's my fifth year uh, here, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Do you like it? Yeah. I, I really like it. You know, it's the first time in my life I don't live in a big city, uh, multicultural and um, with a lot of activity and pollution and uh -huh. noise. And um, to be uh, remote now in the mountain, you know, I, I have a two hours drive to reach whatever airport, like it's two hours drive minimum. Oh, so, do you go to Blacksburg yeah, or? Other. I have choice between, you can pick Asheville, uh, Greensboro or Charlotte. Generally, Charlotte has the best yeah. deals, but of course, yeah. You know, I like the smaller ones because it's easier to to reach and um, and less a bother to park and things like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, so you know, we don't have planes going on on top of our heads. It's very very quiet and and the the landscape. You know, going to work, <laughs> you're in the mountain yeah. and you have beautiful um, views all the time with the mountains, the snow. In the fall, it's the 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 leaves, the color of the leaves, yes. the springs, of flowers all over the place. I found it very inspiring and very peaceful also. And it's so nice to breathe fresh air. And when you go out of work, you can go for a hike. So it's really helped me to focus more on my work as well, because you're not disturbed with, oh, you know, you don't have that many things to do. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you really focus on your music. Yeah, that's nice. I also, I think I prefer, I'm a city person as well, but I'm living in uh, Kansas now, uh, in a city, but a small city in Lawrence, Kansas. And mm. it was really strange for me to go from, I lived in Los Angeles and then New York City and then, yeah, I lived in a lot of places, but but now I'm in a small city and um, it's strange because I like that it's quiet and I like that it's cheap and it's, it's easy to do things and it's easy to park. Everything's easy in a small city, but I miss some things that are in a big city. I miss the uh, many restaurants and I miss the cultural activity, big museums, um, big orchestras. The closest great orchestra to me is the Kansas City Symphony and they're wonderful, but it's still, I have to drive an hour so it's a lot oh yeah 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 it's a lot yeah i see what you mean i, I also miss the, the i miss the same thing as you do miss because i lived in paris uh, i lived in cleveland ohio and i lived in ann arbor michigan before prior oh. to that um and i also miss the diversity of the people you know uh, mm -hmm. it's it's very uh, it's very white in boone <laughs> Yeah, I'll bet. And you know, not a lot of foreigners as well. So I miss a bit that. But uh, you know, uh, I I love wherever I land, be it for vacation or for my life. I I'm really good at adapting to okay. the new place and make it work and seeing all the positive aspects. Now I'm guessing there's not a big uh, French community in Boone. So when you go somewhere and people hear your accent, what how do they respond to you? <laughs> Uh, actually, there are quite a few uh, French people and a, oh, really? a kind of, yeah, not small uh, French community here uh, because, you know, that's a university uh, uh, town. Uh, so it's a lot, it's a big university town. Uh -huh. Therefore, you have uh, a few uh, French uh, speakers here and French natives. Mm, you know, the, the reactions are very different depending on who you have in front of you. Generally, people are always curious where I'm from, uh, generally they're gonna think I'm German. <laughs> and a few, cat yeah, 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 that's really interesting, you know. But uh, if you catch, a few of them catch that I'm French. So yes. it's nice, you know, because then you can start a conversation with the people. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I suppose to your students, it doesn't matter because they're only interested in how talented you are and what a good teacher you are, I think. I, I'm not my student, so I could not be talking for them. Um, yeah. I think it's really good for when you're a, a student to be uh, confronted to diversity. Yeah. And uh, as musicians, uh, listening to another accent is really, really important because then you open your ear to a different thing as well. Mm. And also for them, it's good to have someone who has had a different educational experience, a different culture, because then I'm bringing things that they have 
not met yet and they can you know interact with that and discover things that otherwise they probably would not have discovered yeah wonderful and so you're at appalachian state university uh there in boone and yeah. uh as the director of orchestras and uh, i imagine that um do you do a lot of french music i i suspect that you do a lot of everything right Absolutely. Yeah, you're correct on that. You know, that's funny because when I studied at the Paris Conservatoire, uh, my teacher was Hungarian. And uh, so we did a lot of Hungarian music. I'd say like, probably I feel very, very, very confident with Hungarian music and it's beautiful repertoire. And it was so nice to be a, a, around a Hungarian a musician and teacher and do so many workshops with other Hungarian people because then you have a deep understanding of the music. Mm -hmm. But as an educator, I, I really love to open the, the mind and, uh, you know, and experiences to my students. So I don't limit to only one repertoire or one country. Yeah, and nowadays as you, as you, you can probably, right? Right, yeah, and you, you can't today anymore. Mm. I mean, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have been that way for a hundred years, but now uh, mm. it's time for everybody to, to start showing diversity in music. And, and I love that we're, that we're, we're this year in 2020, because things are different. Uh, conductors seem to be studying a lot more music and learning more about composers they never heard of before. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have been doing it myself because I have more time. <laughs> yeah. That's small detail, but uh, to have the time really makes a difference because we're kind of running all over the place otherwise. Yeah. And to sit down and to open scores and uh, check websites and listen to music. Uh, it's been a really, really wonderful experience. Have you had face-to-face -face orchestra there in Boone? Yeah, yeah. We have been mostly face-to-face -face, uh, up until the numbers in the community uh, of positive, the number of, of positive cases uh, raised very high. Then we decided to switch to online, but still offering the opportunity for face-to-face -to, -face to the students who would wish to keep doing it and understand what were the risk. And actually that's really interesting because half of the orchestra still wanted um, to, to, go, to come face to face and to have coaching. So, oh, great. yeah, so they, they knew uh, what were, you know, uh, that what were the risks for them and they were, it was not mandatory, but they still asked, oh, can we do that repertoire and can we play that and can you come coach us and things. So it's been really wonderful. And yeah. how many students was that when, when half would come? Uh, half, so it would be, of course, separate rooms, you know, and not so, I mean, we have all the rules and uh, oh, very, very, so very everyone strict. Is, uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to organize the schedule so we don't stay more than 30 minutes in a room, then it breathes for 30 minutes. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's no more than a certain number of people, depending on the size of the room, and we clean up, blah, blah, blah. So all of that is respected. But at the end of the day, uh, half of the orchestra is about 30 plus people. Oh, that's big. Yeah. Mm. Wow, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big orchestra. I had to cut my orchestra down at the beginning of the semester. Uh, the university said, my orchestra is about 50 normally. Okay. And so the university said 24 or 25, um, enough that we could sit on the stage six feet apart. So it's about 25 people. So from the very beginning of the semester, my orchestra was small. And mm. then we met the 24 or 25 of us. Sometimes it was 22 or 26, depending on the piece. But we met the whole semester until the, the numbers went up. But we just finished our last concert, like barely in time. We did, we, we did a video recording, not a live concert, but we made the video. Yeah. It was a Thursday. And on Friday, the university said, no more face-to-face. -face. So we barely made it. Oh, wow. So the university decided to switch to online. When was that? Oh, that was two weeks ago or three weeks ago. It was the end of, it was the first week of November. Okay, I yeah. see. But so what happens? Because if you need to cut your orchestra down, that means that some students cannot get the credit for that class. That's true. Well, we have, um, I, I have a full orchestra and a string orchestra and um, our program is small. So the wind players, the wind and brass players also play in band and jazz. They do other, other mm -hmm. things. So we held auditions in the beginning of the semester, and then I chose which. I had a lot, a lot of groups, a little groups with the bigger strings on the orchestra, 
uh -huh. but uh, I had up to 15 groups playing at the same time in different rooms. And, oh my God. <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, it's been kind of a headache to organize, but there are, it's been so profitable. What did you see positive uh, in, in terms of positive learning for your students that things probably you couldn't, they could not have developed uh, prior to the to the pandemic, we didn't think that way. We, you know, or we didn't have time, or because it's a bigger size orchestra, we could not address those questions. So, what do you think was positive for your students during that time? Well, I can say what I saw from my my band and a lot of string players just sit in the middle, in the back, and they follow along, and and they're not really heard. There's, they're not responsible. They fake it. <laughs> You know, some some students, some players do. Even professionals, they sit in the back. You know, if you're watching, uh -huh. uh, if you're watching a professional orchestra in the front of the section, there's a lot of bow, and in the back, it's like, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, of course, it's there's no, as well. <laughs> yeah, and so you see <laughs> yeah. the difference. But, but when I cut when I cut my orchestra down, my string section was like four, four, two, two, one. And so everyone has to play. Everyone's responsible. And, and so we learned how to play like a chamber group a lot more. And I were 13 string players. And so everyone had to play, really play. Mm. It, was, it was hard, that's, but it came, it came out great. great. Yeah. Yeah. Did you use a Finale or Sibelius to write down your arrangements? I'm a Sibelius fan. A Sibelius, yeah. I yeah. prefer Sibelius, yeah. I think now yeah, I haven't used finale in a long time, but I think now the the two are more or less the same quality. But I'm I'll, every file for the last fifteen years is in Sibelius, so that's my program. Yeah, yeah, I use Sibelius as well. I have had also to arrange for the professional professional orchestra I work for, the North Eastern Pennsylvania Philharmonic. So yes. we have been doing some videos with um, smaller, way smaller number of musicians, uh -huh. and then I've had also to to get to decorate the music, you know, like dress the music. Yeah, and also the color, I don't know you, but to me, the orchestration is just the colors and mixing together. It's so exciting, yeah. very, very exciting. Yeah, me too. And and it's beautiful. And then when you have a small group, if you're writing for your, your group in Pennsylvania or for my orchestra, for example, you think, oh, I can't do, um, you know, four brass instruments and some and 15 strings and also a vibraphone and also so you have to be very creative like i can only use one or two people here who do i use which combination will be I great um, and i've been studying yeah. of course the orchestrations of stravinsky because he wrote a lot of small orchestra pieces and you can learn a lot there so I, i'm curious about your your new job in pennsylvania it's a relatively new job yeah yeah you know it's crazy it um it happened uh, in february <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a timing there, you know. <laughs> so this fall yeah. should have been your first season. You're your first season as the music director, yeah? Yes, yes. So, I mean, we kind of um, decided, so it was signed, you know, and decided in February. And uh, I had my last concert with them on Valentine's Day, actually, on the 14th. Okay. And um, and then it stopped. And I don't know when it's going to be the next time. And um, so it's... It's it's challenging because you know it's a first position for me as music director and things is huge, uh, so we have we have a good strategy. We are very motivated to to keep things working and also to keep giving jobs to the musicians because yeah. I don't think we talk about it enough in the society. But artists are are really hurting. I mean, it's serious. It's really serious and. I feel it's uh, also my responsibility with the budget we've got, which is not a ton. Um, it's also my responsibility to, to make sure that um, we keep offering uh, jobs uh, to the musicians. Yeah. Yeah, especially freelance musicians who make, uh, make all their income from playing in five or eight different orchestras. And uh, now they have zero. It doesn't take care more of uh, that, you know, it's very different from uh, France, for example, where you get uh, more uh, paid by the state and the region and the locality. Um, so they are kind of more protected, but here it shows some limits to the system. I think in case of crisis, you have all of these high level skill, uh, skilled workers mm -hmm. because those musicians are un have unbelievably high levels. Yeah, we know it, you know, it's hard since you're a kid practicing your, your skills. Mm -hmm. And yet they don't have jobs and they're not covered at the moment. Yeah. 
Well, are, have you found that, so in Pennsylvania, for example, you have a small budget that you're able to spend money to pay musicians to do projects online and other ways, but you have no income. So how is the orchestra taking care of that? Well, actually, we um, we work really hard on uh, donations. Yeah. Uh, so through uh, what we can do online, and also our CEO uh, is really great at uh, working on grants. Mm -hmm. So we have been able to develop projects, uh, work on these projects, and getting grants. It's it's a daily work, uh, daily applications, but it's been working well so far. Um, in our range, so we need to keep doing that, you know, and um, and uh, hopefully uh, we can make it until the end of the pandemic. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, you, you know, it's it's hard work to to find the funds right now. Yeah, of course, yeah, because um, because nobody's buying tickets to events, and I think I think some donors are still being uh, generous with their money, but other people are holding on to it because nobody knows what's going to happen. Although I'm I'm an optimist, and I think that I think that the pandemic I know the pandemic will end eventually, and I think it will end hopefully soon. I think next season we'll be back almost to normal. We hope. So uh, yeah. if everybody can hang on for just one more, you know, one more spring, then things will be but things will be better. I hope. Yeah, but it's hard for our organizations. You know, it's a long time. Yes. But of course, we are all working really hard to make it happen. Yeah. So I'm curious because a lot of conductors have learned, have had to learn new skills like video editing. Are you doing video editing and that stuff? It, uh, as I told you, I've been back also to Sibelius. I had not used it in years. And so it required to me to be a, a bit back to it. I've uh, learned to cook finally, you know, because uh, I love food, but I never had the time to cook. Uh -huh. And uh, just uh, we've got those organic boxes from lo local producers here. So you sign up and then you get a box uh, for the week. Oh, great. And you don't know what is in the box and you need to manage with what you've got. And it's been very <laughs> exciting to discover all of those vegetables and, and, and uh, produces. I'm, I'm... I see you and try your baguette. Yeah, I hope so too. Okay. <laughs> Au revoir. Bye. Bye.